Welcome to the podcast and this time we're going to be talking about St Arkansas reissued on the 10th of September of 2021 and we're joined by the inimitable Mr David Thomas the mythological. to uh, kick every proceeding off. This evening we're going to play The Fever Dream of Hernando de Soto from St Arkansas V.21 See for Charlie Him and the David Thomas, The Fever Dream of Hernando de Soto. Who yeah. on earth was that, for goodness sake? Well, all right, we've already talked about the importance of the road in my life. And um, after Pennsylvania, I thought, okay, well, let's let the road write this next album. You know, so... I had a buddy in Conway, Arkansas named Danny Grace, who was either the theater department there or part of the theater department there. Hendrix College, I think it was. I can't remember. So anyway, I decided I'd go out and visit Danny. And, um, and, and along the way, I would write the album according to what I saw or thought or felt. And so I set off and I went via a series of back roads and interstates and varying varying levels of road out to Conway. And along the road, I, I wrote, for instance, um, Lisbon. Is that on the album? Lis yes. Yeah, I wrote, <laughs> <laughs> I wrote Lisbon and Phone Home Jonah and... Mm, some, I'm sure, other things. Um, and I got to Conway, and I sat there and visited with Danny for a while. And then I set off and went through Little Rock and down to US-49, which is the other great blues highway that, with Highway 61. And I took 49 East, crossing the Mississippi at Helena Bridge, which is one of the one of the greatest bridge experiences you're going to ever run into. Um, and I highly recommend it. Into, I crossed Helena Bridge and into Mississippi. And um, before I got to US-61, um, the first thing on the other side of the Mississippi in Mississippi, other than the other side of the Mississippi in the state of Mississippi, is out in the middle of nowhere, a huge um, casino where you just, you know, I didn't, you know, you can see it often on a side road in the distance. It's just like Las Vegas plunked down in the cotton fields of Mississippi, just astonishing. And right near there, I passed a road sign which talked about um, Hernando de Soto having set up camp here and and this is where he died, or something something along those lines. And then I went on into, I think it was Clarksville, which is where 49 and 61 meet up, a very famous blues town. And then I took 61 back up north to Memphis and back home. So um, I was very struck by, by, um, by this casino. <laughs> And in the in the in the sign commemorating the death of Hernando de Soto, who was a Spanish explorer back in this region, in the in that region in the 1500s or something, I can't remember, looking for you know the lost city of gold, searching, just wandering all through that area, you know, and um, 
I was just overcome by this notion of him having his journey, his search end, you know, in some undoubtedly squalid camp set up in the middle of the wilderness, and then 400, 500 years later, there's this casino, you know, <laughs> sitting there. And I thought about the Lula, yeah, I thought about the Helena Bridge and, you know, standing underneath the Helena Bridge and, or where the Helena Bridge would have been, which undoubtedly is where DeSoto crossed the Mississippi. And, um, and it just, the song came to me, you know, and, very, you know, I can't remember where the other songs came along specifically. I know Lisbon has something to do with Western Ohio. Well, Slow Walking Daddy says six miles south of Meadville, sitting there is Moose Lodge 2505. Yeah. Um, I've been past Moose Lodge a couple of times. Did you ever eat in it? No, I've never been in it. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of a scary place. I'm sure it isn't. But it, it's, you know... It's a moose lodge, you know, I'm not a moose member, you know, I'm sure they wouldn't care. Oh my gosh, you actually have to be a member then to go to Moose Lodge. That's why I reckoned it was one of these places that only opened when somebody turned up. No, 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 <laughs> no, it's open every day as far as I can tell, but it's it's a moose lodge, you know, I'm, I'm not a member of the mooses. Now, as or the mice, I don't know what they call them, plural of mooses, um, but... Um, I'm sure they wouldn't care. I'm sure they'd be delighted. But, you know, it's packed out every weekend. You know, I can't believe they're all Moose members, but I've never been in, that's all. So St. Arkansas, again, um, it uses some of the names of the band members. Michelle and Mr. Steve mm -hmm. are on this album. Um, and the songs aren't actually about them, though, are they? No, no, of course not. So Mr. Steve, who most people listening to this will probably know as the long head guy who gets angry and, and <laughs> can play his drums very, very loud. Yeah. Oh, Claire de Lune is the yeah. first word. A monstrous spittoon hangs in the air. So why Mr. Steve? Explain. Uh, no idea. Oh. I, came, I had to write a song. I mean, I, had to get, I, get, I wrote the song and I had to have a title. You know, and I think that the line... You know, what, what is it about the monstrous spittoon? A monstrous spittoon hangs in the air while time moves slowly and chases no, each I moment. Thought of, I thought of Steve. I mean, the notion of somebody spitting into the spittoon of the moon just brought Steve to mind. <laughs> you know, I don't know why. <laughs> oh, Claire de Lune, a monstrous spittoon hangs in the air. Slowly and chases each moment, each shape discreetly, each one a bead. So many beads on a string that binds me. Did you have a brother, Danny, who worked in a zoo? <laughs> um, he has a brother not named Danny. and no. he, no, that was about my brother, whose name is not Danny, and he does not work in a zoo, you know. But um, And it's really not about him at all, but I don't know. I, that's the song. The, the song, the song I, that's what I needed in the song at that point. His brother, Danny, works in a zoo, you know. Um, Conversely, the song about Michelle, if you really get into a poet's mind, is, is very Michelle. It's very abstract, but completely on point. Um, and she loves those kinds of songs. They, they are very much Michelle's song. The sheet is nearly white But something still nags at me a smear of graphite I think it might be you Or something you said
So, um, you know, did, did she lead that one? Did you actually have, did she do it? Did you do all the lyrics? Because it just says writers, Herman well, Melman, Temple, Thomas there. Wheeler. I mean, nobody ever sees the lyrics until they come out on the album. Um, or unless they can be, you know, I don't. Was it know. driven by her bass line that she wrote? Or? Well, everything is driven by everybody's lines that they write. But no, that, has that song from the beginning was called Michelle. I had no, I had no, I had no reason to call it. I didn't have a logical reason to call it Michelle, but it just seemed to me to encapsulate Michelle. Now I don't, you know, I don't, you know, Michelle's a very dear person and and very very dedicated um and i don't i can't remember what's what's what are the lyrics in that song it's the eraser i am an eraser the sheet is nearly white but something still nags me it's oh, a smear yeah. of graphite i think it might be you or something you said you well know, yeah that's not about her that's about no but she loves that abstract kind of i yeah, want to say well, shit I, she loves I, that I abstract just, shit all i can tell you is that from the beginning sometimes i don't have a title for a song like Mr. Steve, and I think, who's going to be spitting at the moon? <laughs> Steve, of course. <laughs> you know, but Michelle was always called Michelle. I, I really, uh, I, you know, this is the way my mind works. I, I'm not going to sit here and explain my mind to you. These new band members had, had kind of bedded in by this time. Yeah. Um, you toured with them. They'd yeah. done some of the older material in shows, most notably at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, where you did the modern dance. And they were they were now, I presume, just someone that you could, some people that you could turn up and know that they would know what you need. Oh, yeah. Well, Michelle and well, Steve had everything charted out. I mean, Steve had everybody's parts charted out. You know, Michelle would work, would work assiduously to be ready for any any tour, you know, I could call them up tomorrow. In fact, I'm convinced, you know, and and do a show the day after tomorrow without any rehearsal. You know, they 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 are consummate professionals and consummately dedicated to their own work. I mean, to the work. You know, um, I wish I had forty or fifty of those sort of people. You know. Keith and Dids are very much the same sort of people, you know. Um, that's, you know, I hate rehearsing. I despise it more than you can imagine um, because it's a waste of my time and a waste of my... I see my talent as a, as a limited glass, you know, and every time I have to sing, part of the contents of the glass go down just a little bit, you know, so... Um, I have, I don't, I know the material, even if I can't remember what section it's in, I know the material, you know, and they follow me, you know, the people, people like Michelle and Steve and Keith and Dids, Gagarin, you know, they, they just follow me, you know, they'll, they'll do it, you know, if I go off somewhere, they're there with me, you know, so, um, you know, Steve even knows would know my parts. I would turn to him at a certain various sometimes during a show and say, "What's my next line?" <laughs> you know, how many? How and many he times? always knew that was what well, yeah, was annoying. Well, the, the startling he thing is, he knew. always he always knew. You know, and he says, "You come in after four and a half, but if you make it four, it'll be all right." You know, I mean, you know, I I wish I wish everybody worked to that level. And another thing I've got to say, the reviews of St. Arkansas, unlike the reviews of St. Arkansas, I'm sure, that are going to be in 2021, nobody even either noticed or cared that this wasn't the, in inverted commas, founding members apart from yeah, David yeah, Thomas. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm reading this one, which says, while St. Arkansas doesn't divert from the paths the band members have already travelled, it's worth remembering that these guys started this trip 27 years prior to this album. <laughs> I mean, you know, clearly doesn't. But no know, reviewer would say that nowadays. I mean, well, you yes, know. Well, yes, they would because they don't, 
This review, I don't want to criticize this person because it's standard reviewers. Well, no, it's it's David. He doesn't know that they weren't in the band 27 years the ago. The AV Club wrote that the album is one of Perubu's best works, displaying the kind of intelligence and imagination that gives the avant-garde a good name. All, mu- all music wrote that the band's lyrical and musical creativity is undiminished by time. You cannot read a review of Perubu now without it mentioning somewhere something about ever-changing lineup and all that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, it, you know, it must have started to piss these guys off because they'd been there now for oh, a, quite a few years. Keith Molinay sort of bridged this era because he toured a lot of this material, didn't he? Well, it's he an t- Arkansas. I mean, you know, Keith and I go back to the early 90s from yeah. the Pale Boys. But I with Peribu. With you know, Peribu was, I don't know, later, in the 2000s somewhere. I don't know. But, you know, I... I I, I go back a long time with people. I um, I want to read you this, which we actually had somebody come and help us go through all the old clippings, and a lot has come to light. And it's a really <laughs> kind of startling review of a gig that you played um, in 2002 by a woman named Heather Wilde, and she couldn't find how to get there. She was pissed off as hell because she'd been told to go and review this band who she'd never heard of and she couldn't find it and the weather was miserable and um i believe she's actually in st arkansas actually but it's i will not get called to st arkansas it's called arkansas arkansas <laughs> um and so she finally finds the car park and and she asks somebody um uh you know where do i go to see this band and this guy told her where she went, and it turned out when they appeared on stage that it was Tom Herman who told her where to find the band. But I know I'm talking a lot, which people don't want to hear me, but I'm going to read this to you. I don't remember the names of any of the songs. I don't remember the words the singer spoke in between songs, and I don't remember what most of the band looked like. I remember staying on the edge of my seat listening to the experimental sounds and the hypnotizing voice of David Thomas. And I remember him cracking jokes between songs and taking sips from his whiskey flask and getting pissed off at the faulty mic stand. I remember the intense rhythms of the bass and drums pulsating through my body. I cannot forget the moment Thomas donned the yellow mystery apron and pressed his chest to the speakers, beautifully distorting the sounds in my ears. I remember wanting to hear all of the music this band has ever made. Most of all, I felt overwhelmingly happy that I was introduced to Peribu and was lucky enough to see them perform for the first time in Arkansas. Wow. I mean, that's a gem. And it, it's so easy for people whose lives have been touched by you to have their stories lost in all the mess of, you know, oh, he's not the founding member. And, you know, they haven't been in the band very long. There was somebody who came not knowing who the hell you were, didn't care who you were. Mm-mm. Didn't want to be there. <laughs> but left a different person. So, I mean, you hear that a lot, don't you? Does it still move you? Does it still move me? Did it ever move you? <laughs> I I don't know. I don't want to, you know, do I depend on that sort of stuff? No. If I never got that sort of sort of response, would I keep doing what I do? Yes. Um, now, that just happens to be me. You know, you remember, this is a guy who, up until the last year of her life, never did anything, never hugged my mom never kissed we didn't kiss or hug in my family once in a while we would you know we would shake hands you know <laughs> my mom and i would shake hands you know when she was dying you know her heart had already burst she had her my brother was with her and she called me on the phone and she said well um i just wanted to check in with you that everything is okay and um um and you know, we sort of chatted for a while, and she says, well, I have to go now. And, and, you know, that's the sort of family I come from. That's the sort of, so when you say, does this move you? I don't know. I don't know if it moves me or not. It's it's gratifying. It's helpful, you know, but would I change anything? No. I do what I do. 
Yeah, and I know. I'm going to do it till the day I damn die. The point is, this woman loved what you do, and oh, and no. I we had a similar experience when we took the Carnival of Souls gig to the Isle of Wight. And it was a bit of a moment when we drove up and found out it was a family festival. <laughs> Babies in prams, kiddies on, oh, on bouncy castles. Time, there was this whole time in the early 80s where everybody thought I would be, a, particularly in Holland, where I'd be a children, good children's entertainer. So I was actually booked into Rotterdam for a children-only show. And it was a disaster you know, it was it was just horrifying. Never ever do it again. But I thought, oh, okay. Well, sure, I'll give it a shot. I know it was a nightmare. I don't get along with children. I mean, it's not that I don't like them, though. I wish they would grow up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know but uh, you know, and I don't have any children, and 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 I'm not looking to have children. You all. Are my children, um, but um, the funny thing was, I sold a CD to a young lad there. He can't have been more than fifteen, and he had been so excited all the way through the gig because, you know, he was with his mum. He didn't want to be there, no. um, and he he just had not moved from the front of the stage with his mouth open the entire time. Um, and then I saw on Twitter the following day that he'd seen this band called Perubu at the at the festival and, and they just blew him away and he bought the album but it's really shit <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, uh, well you we know should find him and yeah, yeah but... invite him to another gig i don't know whether we'll go back to the isle of Wight, but in case people haven't listened to the podcast before this this is to celebrate the St. Arkansas album, which is coming out on September the 10th. On lovely blue vinyl. On lovely blue vinyl. And as, show them the vinyl? If you want to. Um, and it's been remixed by David Thomas in 2021. Um, and frankly, you could call it a different album. Um, is, yeah, well. Slow Walking Daddy blew me away because I've heard that many, I many can't times. do this. <laughs> I'll do it in a second. All right. So we're going to play Slow Walking Daddy now. Enjoy. Of the album, beautiful blue, and it's got the green. Don't get your fingers on the album. The I know, right? On Instagram, all these record stores invite the the star along to hold their album. So many of them are holding the vinyl, well, not on the edge. They're probably trying to ruin it, so they have to buy another one. Exactly. So anyway, well, this that's, is mine, so I don't want to. This is David, ruin. so I'm not allowed to ruin it. But I can't get it back in because it's so new. Um, so yes, they've been remixed. And in case people haven't listened to the podcast before this, or perhaps even you'd like to say it in a different way, 
Um, you've given this a more live sound. However, I'd question that with this one because this one, I think, sounds even more polished and, and I don't know, it's just exciting, David. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, I want to know, when you went from Pennsylvania remixing to St. Arkansas, did you approach it in exactly the same way? Yes. I, you know, I, I approached it in exactly the way I said, is that I took it all, I listened to everything, and I put it together the way I felt about it in the year 2021 with enough time that I could do some work and then go away, do something else for a week or two weeks and come back to it, you know. I, and um, I have my internal studio now the way I like it and with lovely speakers and lovely technology and, and you know, yeah. In, uh, we were talking on the last podcast about how the media argument sort of ramped up a notch um, in the lyrics. And on St. Arkansas, you kind of have the solution to that, which is that the radio will set you free. Um, radio has been a huge influence in your life. You adore the medium, you adore the hardware. You know, tell people what radio means. Well... I don't know. Back in the 60s, you know, which I always have to go to because that's the beginning of my any level of consciousness. Um, the people who were the, doing the great work on television, like Goulardi and his ilk, were all radio people. They had all come from radio. Um, and so though they were in a different medium, they were bringing the old, they were bringing radio, their, their aesthetic values from radio and they were all basically punks you know long before they were punks they were punks you know real punks you know and um so i remember getting my first transistor radio and it was a little battery operated thing about this big and it had seven transistors you know now i didn't know what a transistor was but this one had seven you know, and I would, I would sit there all night. I would turn the radio on next to my pillow when I went to sleep and just listen all night, you know, have it playing all night long. And there, there used to be this guy on late night radio named Alan Douglas, I think it was. And he would, he would talk about, he would have people come in and talk about UFOs or, or various Fortean events, you know, and, conspiracies and this that and the other i don't know it was, it was just as one of those sort of shows um and i loved radio i love the notion of these sound waves all of these transmissions passing through my body through the walls through everything through the air you know there to be picked up by seven transistors you know um and everything has been you know my my life has been centered around radio. Now, I don't, I don't, you know, I really don't like pop radio very much, you know, um, anymore. But I listen to it, you know, it from time to time. Um, I tend to not listen to much talk radio anymore because I'm fed up with it all. But um, uh, I can't tell you why. I don't know. It's just that from the very... I'm maybe the last of the radio generation, the last of the record store generation of people. All my friends don't understand me And my wife begins to fear That I've lost some sense of balance And I've lost Radio, AM radio, outer radio, the 
You know, I remember going into the, the first time I went into a record shop, it was like going into a holy place, you know, and the, the record store clerk was elevated on this sort of podium. And I remember just, I didn't know what I, I didn't, you know, Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass was everything, as everything I knew about pop music, except that there was this guy named Captain Beefheart that I liked. I'd heard his record on a, his his voice on a Frank Z on Hot Rats, a Frank Zappa record, and because um, mothers the the mothers of invention Uncle Meat album was the first one I ever bought, you know. So um, I remember going there and just looking through the racks and taking the albums out by people I'd never heard of, like Rolling Stones or the Beatles, you know, <laughs> and, and and looking at the front and looking at the back, you know, and I finally, you know, I, I ran across the beef art section. And I got, I'm sure I got out Trout Mask Replica and whatever, I, and I think absolutely, um, and then the one before that, I can't, Mirror Man or, or the other one, um, and going up to the clerk at the record store and handing it up to him, you know, Fearful as all get out, you know, that he would sneer at my choices or anything like that, you know, and he, he took, you know, he took the records and he kind of went, you know, and I thought, oh, oh my God, I'm in, I'm in with the in crowd, you know, I mean, and the, you know, going, you have no idea, I mean, I'm sure you must have, people have had, Smiths must have had similar experiences going into a record shop. Oh my God, I lived in Reading and our only record store was above the um, camping shop. <laughs> so you had to go through the camping shop and up the stairs and then it was just like a storeroom. Um, but yeah, that was where I bought my very dubious uh, choices of first albums. What was your first album? Oh my God, that's going to be so embarrassing. What? sticks yeah <laughs> <laughs> well the first record i ever bought was a single in the year 25 25 i mean i remember taking that home and going oh boy you know because i was into science fiction you know i've always been and i you know i listened to the hell out of that in the year 25 25 if man is still alive you know and then the next single i bought was um was a bob dylan single one of his romantic ones um Lay Lady, I think it was in it, Lay Lady, Lay, Lay Across My Big Brass Bed. And those are the first two records. Then my buddy and I were making films, stop action films. The Day the Earth Met the Rocket from the Tombs was this 20 minute stop action film made with prunes, you know, and various things, you know, props. And um, took us forever, you know. And he was he was into Zappa, you know, and he he gave you know, uh, and I heard Uncle Meat, and I thought, oh, this is good. Now you go from Herb Albert to Uncle Meat, okay, by Zappa, you know, and and I thought, oh, okay, so I I, 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 I maybe that's when I went and got Hot Rats from the record store. And anyway, I got Hot Rats, and I heard this singer on it, Captain Beefheart. He's just on one track, and I thought, wow, oh, this is good. Hmm, Captain Beefheart. You know, and so I went down and looked for his records, you know. So um, I can't remember what I'm answering. <laughs> no, neither can I. You asked me a question. It was about radio, Radio, basically. so I don't know how that ties in, but and, it does. And, you know, we've, we've given a huge nod to uh, radio by Taking Dark, which was a very long song, and we've done, you've done a radio edit of it. Um, the radio shall set you free. Yeah. Um, and this is kind of like, I mean, Perubu have been played a lot more on radio recently, but the early days and, and you know, as a sort of nostalgic thing or whatever. And uh, BBC Six have always been very supportive of, of playing the, the new uh, titles. And you actually did a radio show as well recently where you picked out your your favorite songs to play on oh, Soho Radio. On that, on Soho, what, what was it called? Soho Radio. Soho Radio. So do you think you're a frustrated DJ? Yeah, no, I'm not a frustrated. I couldn't, I, a, a DJ has to listen to tons of stuff, you know, and I'm not the sort of person who's going to listen to tons of stuff, you know. Um, my favorite DJ at the moment is Alice Cooper, who does a late night show, all night late night show every, like five times a week on planet rock or whatever it's called and and he's a very good dj 
But um, and I suspect he doesn't really listen to all this stuff. You know, I'm sure he just phones in. You know, phones in bits that they drop in between. But um, no, I I've never had any inclination to be a DJ. I I would I would I'm not mentally suited to it. I I will sit here as you well know and listen to one album. Weeks on end, just come in and play it again, and then listen to it over and over and over and over and over again. One thing I'm, I'm interested in, in in England on Sunday, they would play the uh, charts, and every person in England, every person, and of course I'm exaggerating, but every person would be sitting there with their cassette recorder, and they'd be pressing record and they'd be trying to cut out the DJs, yeah. you know, little bits in between so they could do like a mixtape. Um, was there anything like that in America where it was an actual national program that everyone tuned into? No, I mean, there were national programs like Dick Clark's, Dick Clark and you know, I'm sure a couple others. Um, but I don't, I never had any inclination to sit there. And, oh you know. my God, it was so exciting when you got well, the you pause have to button. Remember, this was in the 60s, there was AM radio. AM radio was king. None of this damn hippie crap about stereo and talking, hey, kids, you know, uh, you know, t you know, it's, hey, yeah, we're on here now, and here's the question mark and the Mysterians, you know. And there was a dozen stations wixie 1260 you know and, and cklw out of detroit you know and on and on and on so it was just constantly playing you know uh, you didn't have to you know and there was none of this nonsense and baloney that came in with fm radio i hated fm radio you know i mean i liked the people they were nice people they were dedicated you know, but I didn't, I, I really didn't like the stereo, you know, hey, we're going to, you know, sort of thing. But I forget it. I want AM. Well, uh, we're going to play the radio shall set you free for now. But just so that I can show my face again, the only reason I bought a Styx album was because it had a hologram on it. And everybody <laughs> told me it looked really cool All on, right, your, what was the on your stereo. you bought? Uh, the second album, I think, was Bat Out of Hell. <laughs> yeah, it didn't well, get that's, much that's better. Not, you know, no, he Meatloaf is an accomplished pop performer. I mean, I I have no, you know, great arrangements. Totally bombastic is all get out. You oh could, yeah, but he had to. Have you could never. I don't think you could ever put anybody's album up against those Meatloaf albums for bombacity. I mean, that was it was taking bombacity to a to a futuristic extreme yeah but to be fair he had a songwriter well yeah so you know i'm surprised you're not compared lazily to to meatloaf more often but they tend to compare you most to to beef heart well, etc has absolutely you know the only reason i get compared to beef heart is because we both have strange different approaches to things you know beef heart was very very directly influenced by the blues you know, my influence from the blues is far more indirect, far more tempered with country music, far more tempered with folk music and various other things. You know, we don't even sound alike. You know, I wish I could sound like Beefheart. I would give anything to be Captain Beefheart, but I don't set out to imitate him. And I, you know, and if you had, if I had to say what the most influ single most influential album in my life has been it's kick out the jams by the mc5 that taught me everything i needed to know about rock music and recording and music and it can teach anybody else the same things so on the 10th of september these two reissues if that's what we want to call them although they are sounding very different albums are released yeah. um on fire records and you're going to be going live um, with a live, live, live gig, not a pre-recorded live gig, no, but a, don't do a live, live gig with Gagarin and Keith Molinay. Um, what are your expectations of how that's going to sound? Because surely that's going to be different again. Well, I don't have expectations, you know. <coughs> I mean, this has been set up and I'm, I'm not going to think very much about it until three minutes before we hit the broadcast button. You know, it's just the way I am. I don't, I don't. I don't anticipate. I don't. 
imagine. I just do what I'm supposed to do. So after this, you know, you'll have been doing a lot of looking back. You've you've remixed pretty much everything, including we've got the box set coming out in January, which has the final why I hate women yeah. and kind well, so, but why I hate women will not be on the album. No, um, uh, in the box set. Yeah, oh, no, that's no, a big no, surprise. No, no, it's no, coming. No, no, no. This is this is one of my greatest, and this is one of my single greatest accomplishments. Is when that comes out because this this is gonna. You know, well, no, you, you, I get to as I get to tell you what my my points are, which is that this is this is a major breakthrough in rock and roll history. <laughs> uh, lady from Shanghai, Carnival of Souls, and Long Live Peribu. So, yeah, we're excited for the gig on the tenth. That will be live streamed. You'll have to keep an eye on our social media and newbie projects to see where that will be yeah but we um, never announce these things particularly well except to be at honest, the last minute it's because you're supposed to give me calendar updates for we're the always last year but we're always don't. worried it's all gonna fall apart <laughs> terribly yeah. and not happen so yeah. it's always a bit on the edge of your seat yeah. um anyway we're going to finish this podcast with 333 i'm very aware i didn't hit record on my own camera so you're going to have lots of interesting things to watch instead of me for the first half of this podcast um but let's go out with 333 and say a very big thank you to mr david thomas join us on the 10th of september buy the albums if you want to we've got them in both vinyl and cd and, and they two are, different shades of blue oh my god yes they're so pretty and we will not leave it so long before we do the next podcast oh, yes we will um, we've been very, very busy over at patreon.com slash Perubu. If you haven't seen what we're doing there, we live stream three times a month with completely uh, original shows that have new videos and archive live footage. And to be honest, it's it's meant that this pandemic has been the busiest time of oh, our yeah. I, careers. I've been busier this year than ever before in my life. Also check out our Bandcamp releases. I think that may be the focus of uh, one of the upcoming podcasts. Uh, there's some very interesting stuff with our official, unofficial bootlegs. Um, and uh, yeah, go take a listen. You don't have to pay anything unless you want to. But if you do want to, then we love pay them, you. Pay, yeah, if you do want to, pay me a lot. Um, and we will see you very soon. Here's 333.